Welcome to this event uh, hosted by the Cambridge Department of Geography. Um, it's a great pleasure to see so many of you here uh, and my great privilege personally to host this event as the current head of department at the Department of Geography. Uh, my name is Bhaskar Veera. Uh, I have the great pleasure today of being joined by a wonderful panel. Uh, I have a great group of colleagues friends and current students who will be speaking uh, to the issues that we're discussing in this panel. Uh, and I'm going to start just by briefly introducing you to our fellow panelists. Uh, our first panelist is Victoria Ayodeji. Victoria is a current final year undergraduate student at Queens and uh, is, is uh, about to take her final exams in a week's time. And I'm delighted that Victoria is here to be with us. Uh, she's the only person from her school cohort who received an offer from Oxbridge some years ago. She's been passionate about enacting social change through access to education, has, has spent much of the last five years engaging in a number of projects and initiatives that align with this and uses her personal experiences through public speaking, through mentoring, through ad advocacy work to support young people from less advantaged backgrounds overcome barriers to accessing higher education. She's been nationally recognized with an outstanding achievement award and an upreach top 10 award at the Student Social Mobility Awards hosted at the House of Lords and very recently featured on the Royal Geographical Society's Ask the Geographer podcast, where she spoke about her experience of applying to university and how growing up in inner city London has informed her interest in music cultural hybridity, as well as finding solutions to educational inequality. Uh, wonderful to have you with us, Victoria. Um, I'm delighted also to be joined by uh, Matipa Mukundiwa, who's a PhD student at Emmanuel College, uh, currently uh, doing her PhD with us in the department. She did an undergraduate degree in politics and international relations at the University of Manchester. Uh, and a master's in African studies at the University of Oxford. Uh, she's currently enjoying thinking with and learning from Africa in her PhD, where she's researching coloniality and decoloniality in Zimbabwean secondary schools. Uh, outside of academia, she's worked with a number of organizations such as Good Food Oxford and the Gyros Jiri Association for Disabled People in Zimbabwe. Delighted to have you both with us. Um, we're also delighted to have uh, Dominic Wogre, uh, who was uh, in the department in the late 1980s and the early 1990s at Selwyn College, uh, went on to do uh, a master's in environmental and natural resource economics at University College London, uh, probably one of the pioneers on that program. It was an early time when natural resource economics was first being thought about, developed a substantial career in the fields of sustainability. Uh, with the UK uh, Natural uh, Environment Research Council, Institute of Hydrology, uh, then with the International Consultancy Environmental Resources Management, and now most recently with the World Economic Forum, where he started a number of their environmental initiatives uh, and uh, currently heads the Center for Global Public Goods with a particular responsibility for the World Economic Forum's collaboration with the international community on delivering partnerships for the sustainable development goals. Uh, really delighted that Dominic can be with us. Obviously, he will be speaking today in his personal capacity as an alumni and friend of the department, uh, but brings to the table some fantastic professional experience, which we look forward to hearing about. Um, and I'm finally delighted to be joined also by my colleague and friend, Professor Sarah Radcliffe, uh, Sarah is a senior member of the department, works in the fields of development and political geographies, focusing on the ambivalent processes of inclusion and exclusion that arise in development and citizenship. She's done extensive ethnographic fieldwork and has had interactions with Andean societies from Ecuador to Chile. And she's been teaching post-colonial geographies for over 15 years at Cambridge well before decolonization became the buzzword that it's become today. Uh, her book, Decolonizing Geography and Introduction will be published by Polity Press early in 2022. She's a fellow of Christ College and a fellow of the British Academy. 
So thank you all for being with me uh, today. And I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Dominic, if I can turn to you to start us off. You were in the department in the late 1980s and the early 1990s. Reflecting on your time in Cambridge, what are your thoughts about issues of diversity and representation in our discipline in geography? Uh, thanks, Bashka, and uh, it's a delight, um, privilege, honor to be here and be with such a great panel. So, and thanks also for putting on the conversation, which I think is very timely and a good one to have. Yeah, I was with the department 1989 to 1992, um, and uh, it was pretty unicolor um, in terms of uh, what it looked like. Um, and it was also, interestingly, um, quite tilted towards a certain kind of, uh, let's say undergraduate, if I recall correctly. There were a lot of rowers um, and things like that, um, which is beautiful. Cambridge is wonderful, uh, those sorts of things. But, um, you know, it had that element to it, shall I say. I came from um, a particular background, which wasn't that similar. I was one of the comprehensive uh, school children who came in, and obviously, you know, from a different kind of uh, race mix. Uh, and, I was just blown away by the teaching that I got um, at the department. Um, and I, that's why I'm such a fan of the topic and why I think it can be absolutely the vanguard of some of the conversations that we're having today. I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, I remember in my first year, I was, we, we had the tutorials, I think, and it was at Sydney Sussex College. Um, oh, let me think, maybe Stuart Corbridge would be, it was, yeah, so it's like a political job for us, I think, and um, it was quite scary. Uh, uh, we're all sitting there, kind of, you know, nervous. And he gave he gave, gave us two books to read, um, and they were both books about the uh, the Raj, the British Raj in India. And he didn't say anything; he just said, "Read these two books." Um, and book number one, as it turned out, was a sort of quite trad, maybe slightly kind of centre right sort of reading of you know, empire and Britain and India and all sorts of things. The other one was a very left-leaning kind of Marxist take on colonialism and India. Um, and the point is he didn't say anything, just said read them both. And it just totally blew my mind when I came back to him because how can there be two completely different perspectives on what is supposed to have been one single event in space and time? I'd never experienced that in my kind of educational background where I just read school textbooks or, you know. And he said, that's the point. You know, and of course, he placed it in the spatial, you know, context of geography as well as um, the political history. So things like caste and region and north and south. But it absolutely opened my mind. And I cannot tell you how much that prepared me for the work that I went on and, and did. Um, so scroll forward from that kind of experience, um, which was so valuable and illustrated to me the utter importance of, um, you know, if I can, decolonization, decolon, um, think about colonies, think about like kind of um, you know, ants in their nests. So these are like silos, right? If you decolonize, you're actually breaking down the silos of the thinking uh, between the different spaces. And I, it just suddenly felt like that. I'd never experienced that before, um, which was brilliant. So it's not about kind of, you know, this or that. It was just enabling a multi, perspective view on the world to take place. In the job that I have now, I'm at World Economic Forum, which is I'm a managing director on our board, we're dealing with real life challenges. Um, uh, for example, um, in the Amazon with the, um, you know, the deforestation in the Amazon, which is driven both by kind of government policy, but also uh, private companies. So this public private space is the thing that I operate in. And what's fascinating there um, is uh, that the, the, um, the Amazon countries, Colombia, uh, Ecuador, Peru, uh, uh, Brazil, um, are very resistant uh, to um, an outside solution like, you know, aid, ODA, from the French or the Norwegians or something like that, um, without any kind of deep understanding of culturally, historically, where they're coming from in terms of uh, that resource base. And it's really interesting when you then you place NGOs, which can be quite Western orientated into that mix, 
or local indigenous groups into that mix or indeed development professionals into that mix or companies or whatever. And without that thinking that Stuart Corbridge gave me, you can see it. If other people don't have that ability to look at two different perspectives, how suddenly the conversation all gets stuck quite quickly because what runs deep in that situation is that years and years and years ago, um, biopiracy began. So the British went over to that part of the world, took the rubber um, from many of that forest and grew plantations in Malaysia. More recently, uh, arguably US and other uh, firms took IP related to pharmaceutical um, capabilities from plants, went back to the US, created drugs, and uh, the trade rules were adapted so that the IP couldn't flow back to the countries. Um, and those connections as to how history has interacted over the years in space as well as time run very deep in terms of then the solutions one is trying to create for today. And uh, the teaching that I got um, has really helped me see these different perspectives much more clearly than some who are very expert in, in topics and it's been fascinating. So I just feel that geography has a massive contribution, not only as a, a sort of historical revision vision, but also in the discipline that it offers to the brains of today as people are going through their undergraduates for these multi-sectoral, multi-historical problems that we face given the entanglements that we're in in the world at the moment. So I think it's an incredibly important uh, topic, um, but perhaps for even more reasons than we might have considered to start with. Um, so those were some of the reflections and why I'm so delighted to be here speaking in this personal capacity as an alumni from <clears throat> something years ago. <laughs> Dominic, thank you so much. And, you know, I think what's coming through so strongly is the importance of pluralism in terms of uh, knowledge systems and uh, a sense of respectfulness of the different perspectives that people bring when you're thinking about uh, solutions, which is the world that you're in, you know, that mutual respect for the perspectives that people bring uh, help to take some of these things forward to address these bigger problems. Victoria, I'm going to turn to you next, sort of moving from someone who was here in the 1980s to somebody who's with us today, if I may. Uh, as a current undergraduate in the department, what does decolonizing geography mean to you? Uh, how does this relate to the experiences and expectations of both current and future students in the department. Yeah, um, thanks so much for having me today. I'm yeah, really honored to be on the panel. Um, and yeah, very happy that this conversation is being had. So I guess more widely, I first came across conversations around decolonizing within education, especially British education systems back in 2016. So I think like before, like a lot of university students or school students kind of knew about decolonizing. So I think there's definitely been a a lot more popularity over the last few years, which is a good thing. Yeah, so I first came across the whole conversation around decolonizing um, British, British education systems back in 2016, so when I was 17 years old. And at the time I was applying to study geography at Cambridge, um, so five years ago, full circle. <laughs> and so I was on a one week summer school at um, Cambridge actually, and I was organized by the charity, the Sutton Trust. And so I was able to have a one week insight into geography at Cambridge and that was really useful. And I think for me during the week, I was really, really curious about you know, how did universities and how do students um, understand colonial histories in relation to what kind of course content, con what kind of course content is actually being taught in the lecture theater. And so I kind of just asked one of the student volunteers about their own experiences of reading lists, you know, um, what kind of things are currently being, what kind of things are currently um, happening on the university campus for students in particular. And so I was quite grateful. So the student actually recommended a website to me that I still read till this day <laughs> called Gaudem Magazine. And so Gaudem is basically an online publication that is aimed at uplifting the voices of women of color. Um, and yeah, I was pre pretty much hooked on the website um, and I was always using it after school. And it was great to kind of hear about the different stories of university students and how, basically hear about their experiences of organizing on university campuses and how they're trying to um, challenge their um, faculties to become a lot more diverse, um, but also challenge their faculties to kind of think about different um, ways of knowing and different um, more diverse reading lists, for example. I guess to answer the question, what does decolonizing geography mean to me? I think for me, it's fundamentally about having that conversation um, with faculty, but also with students, um, trying to kind of find ways to try and untangle geographic knowledge and geographic power 
but also try and come to like a reckoning, a reckoning and understanding of how geography and the history of geography, as we know it, has kind of played into um, certain power relations over space and time. So not really being afraid of it, not really being afraid of the past, but kind of trying to move towards the future. And so your question about, you know, how does this relate to my experiences and expectations for current and future students in the department? I think we're at a very um, nice time in history because I think these conversations are being had, which is a good thing. And I think it's a step in the right direction. And I think a lot more um, students are definitely trying to mobilize on campus. So I think having those continued conversations, um, I guess a more personal example, I study post-colonialism as one of the papers. Um, and yes, so Sarah teaches that paper. And I think for me, I find it really useful to have roundtables to discuss decolonizing education. And so that happened um, in my final year. And I, and I kind of thought to myself, oh, why? I kind of wished, you know, this happened in first year. I kind of wish I had this edu like introduction um, a lot more earlier. So it kind of brings up the question of, you know, how does the British education system more widely try and foster these conversations at an earlier age? Because um, I think it's quite easy to kind of think about conversation around decolonizing as trying to replace reading lists. I don't think it's about that. And, you know, that's not what it's about. It's about trying to think more holistically, trying to um, add in more diversity. And I think often when there's a lack of understanding, then people tend to try and like shy away from these, com these kind of conversations. I think that's quite important. Um, yeah, I think that's kind of like what I have from my end. Thanks, Victoria. And you know, as you as you've alluded to it towards the end, uh, there's a sort of characterization of these agendas, which is not necessarily informed by what's actually happening in in terms of the ways in which we're approaching this issue. Um, I'll turn to Matipa. Uh, Matipa, you're a postgraduate in the department, and but you also bring a really valuable international perspective to these debates. Um, and again, I want to ask you about your understanding of the decolonizing geography agenda, but also to think about what this tells you about the roles and the responsibilities that we have uh, as the Department of Geography in Cambridge, as a, as a leading department in the discipline. What are our wider responsibilities around these questions of, of, of knowledge, knowledge production, power, uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, thank you, Bhaskar, for having me on this panel. I think before I answer any of your questions, what has informed my understanding of decolonizing in general is the many African and Black scholars who were thinking, um, not just scholars, but you know, activists and community organizers who were thinking about decolonial work long before it became the buzzword that it is now. So I just really, before I say anything, want to acknowledge that anything I'm about to say is not new and is really informed um, by decades of work by them. But to answer your first question of what my understanding of decolonizing geography is, um, I, I think that any when it comes to decolonizing, everyone is coming from a specific place, right? Um, which is informed by their life experiences. And so, as a black woman uh, who's an international student and who's new to the discipline of geography, I have found that the de my, my understanding of the decolonizing geography debates is that they're very centered on particular conversations that are influenced by certain scholars in the Western Academy who are in conversation with the Latin American decolonial thinkers. Um, but like, as I said, from my experience as a black international student, that is not my starting point when I understand decolonizing. So I've kind of um, had these two different understandings meet. Um, and with my experience in African studies, that is actually what has informed my understanding of decolonizing geography. And now I'm in this discipline and that is not the discipline starting point. But to answer your second question on the role and responsibility of departments like ours, I think of the word humility, uh, which ties in with what you mentioned. You mentioned mutual respect. And I don't think that it's what can institutions like Cambridge or what can institutions like the department of geography at Cambridge um, 
teach other people, but I actually think it's what can institutions such as Cambridge learn from those on the outside as it were. So the outside being the outside of the academy, the outside of the United Kingdom, the outside of Europe. Um, and really, really humbly accepting that there's people who've been doing this work long before. And it's more of how can we help, how we being Cambridge or the Department of Geography, how can we help you? Like that is, I think one of the, the, the roles and responsibilities that departments such as this one can take. Thank you. Thanks, Matipa. And I'm, I'm really hoping we'd be able to pick up on this in the conversation which follows as well. But I think this approach of respectfulness, humility, recognizing our very small place in a much larger converse of thought, which has predated us and continues to happen elsewhere and bringing as you said, the outside in, uh, in constructive ways is so important, I think, to the perspectives that I and many others in the department absolutely share. And I, I want to turn to Sarah because I think that's so reflective in the work that you've done throughout your career, uh, working with different communities. And you've been thinking about these issues in so much depth. Uh, you've got a new book coming out on the subject with polity. Uh, Maybe I'll turn to you finally to say, you know, what does the decolonizing geography agenda mean to you? What steps can we take in relation to these large challenges that, that people have been talking about? Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, yes, and um, I feel like I'm very much building on what the other panelists have already said. Um, but I suppose that I can bring in some context to the way that we go forward from that wish to have mutual respect, that, that wish to break down some of the silos between different ways of thinking. And so what I want to, you know, just introduce um, is, is some of the sort of ideas of the ways that I've been thinking about it. And um, unlike Matipa, for example, I have been more influenced by the writers in the Latin American context, um, but very much too um, with black geographies and indigenous geographies in Anglophone geography, which reaches, of course, um, around the world, um, touching down in very specific ways um, in each place. Um, but I wanted to start by just clarifying something which I think sometimes people do get um, uh, find difficult to understand, which is the difference between decolonizing, um, which is what we're talking about here, changing the way that we interact with different knowledges, and political decolonization, which is you know, the creation of independent countries from former colonies, um, which happened in different waves over the, um, from the early 19th century um, into the mid 20th century, and is an unfinished process um, in some cases. But there's a misapprehension perhaps out in um, public opinion that this means that colonialism is just a thing of the past, that um, you know, the official end of colonialism occurred and therefore um, colonialism um, is, is something which we don't have to worry about now. Whereas my discussions about this with students and listening to what people have to say in Latin America is really that colonialism is really alive and kicking, unfortunately, but it operates in ways that require close and often quite sort of discipline specific um, attention, um, not to whether a country has its own flag and its own anthem, but really um, across a number of different um, dimensions of social life, which um, are very important. You know, the kind of fundamental question about what resources are distributed um, and how they're used and who they're offered to. Um, also questions about um, the mindsets that Western Euro-American um, scholars and publics um, have and, and how they continue to predominate in the world, even in contexts 
where they're inappropriate or um, in fact actively damaging as um, the example that Dominic outlined in the Amazon illustrates very strongly. Um, but also I think that colonialism is very much um, alive um, in the present world um, because it influences the way that we treat each other um, in the everyday and um, across generations. And that that works to exclude or to demean um, particular groups and to place certain people and the, the ways that they think about the world above others. So for those three reasons, I think that, you know, we're talking about something which is very um, pervasive and very important in a number of different facets. So decolonizing in that context, to come back to the kind of core term that we're discussing here, decolonizing is about identifying and challenging what geographer Derek Gregory called the colonial present. Um, and um, this means, as has already been outlined, changing the way that we see the world away from a sort of um, one world view that comes from um, Northwest Europe um, and pluralizing that vision of the world and understanding that we're inside um, and relating to that, um, those plural perspectives um, in a number of different um, ways. And they're really crucial to understand in the way that we do our teaching and the way that we do our research. Um, and perhaps work towards an understanding that there are many different worlds in the world um, and we have to have a, a set of mutual respect and um, a relations with those different worlds which are going to be quite incommensurate in some cases with the ones that we're familiar with. Um, and if I have time, Basca, I just thought I would sort of talk a little bit about what geography brings to that um, mm. conversation. Um, in the sense that I feel that geography um, has a particular responsibility in this regard um, of decolonizing. But I also think, and I'd be very interested to hear the other panelists' perspective on this, but it, that it brings particular strengths to the decolonizing discussions. Um, first, the responsibility, geographical tools of mapping and surveying um, and territorial organization have been um, integral to operations of direct colonialism and other um, forms of control and domination. Um, and this um, led to the professionalization in the 19th century of the discipline. So we're, we're very much implicated in colonialism. Um, but geography today, I think, has these incredible strengths, which is that it is a discipline that straddles different worldviews. Um, Dominic very vividly recalled a, a supervision with um, Stuart Corbridge. Um, but also, of course, I imagine, Dominic, that you were also doing physical geography and social geography, human geography. And of course, those are two different perspectives on the world. And, and so geographers are already used to working across those different epistemologies. Um, and, and also I think that geography has become so um, attuned and has been for a very long time um, because of um, post-colonial influences, because of feminisms of different sorts, because of the work of geographers in different parts of the world who really were listening and trying to have respectful conversations, that, that we have moved in many ways, not enough, and we still have a lot of a long way to go, um, but we have become a discipline which is um, used to holding those sometimes awkward, sometimes difficult conversations. Um, and the second point I wanted to say is that, and I think that Victoria very neatly alluded to this, that, that decolonizing is not just about getting rid of things. It's not a sort of zero sum game in which um, there's sort of a ban on white authors or that there's a token inclusion of authors from say the global south. Rather it's additive, it's enriching, it's empowering. And for all of those reasons, I think that um, you know it's a it's a great opportunity to, to take forward the decolonizing agenda um, at the moment. Um, and it enriches um, students' engagements and us as researchers, um, us who are academics here in the department, it enriches our understanding when we're doing our research. Um, 
so uh, that so it, just to wrap up if i can um the issue for me is somebody has mentioned already that the sort of going into the future um and i think that we have to have a real reckoning with um, a number of things and recognize, um, and geography can add to this, but you know, our categories, our presumptions, our concepts that we use in geography, um, which in a very everyday sense, whether that's territory or whether it's glacier, those categories, those concepts already have so much of a particular way of thinking about the world embedded in them. And so decolonizing is really trying to sort of think beyond those categories and think beyond those mindsets, which make a glacier seem to be a straightforward thing or make a territory a straightforward um, thing. Um, but decolonizing is, as Dominic um, has talked about in describing um, his own life um, history and, and way that he's come out of geography into the um, working in a bit, very important field is that geographers, because of the training that they get, um, are taken up by employers um, in all sorts of fields um, and they go and live in all sorts of different parts of the world. And in each of those contexts, they need to understand the complexity of, of where those places and, and different people have come from. And I think that that's um, reason for decolonizing geography. And, and finally, on a personal note, I think decolonizing also makes has made me really conscious of the ways in which I can, however unwittingly, but how um, I reproduce the forms of exclusion um, because of the privileges and um, benefits that I've had. Um, and it makes me also wish to um, challenge that for myself and the position that that puts me in, in relation to um, geography. Thank you, Sarah. And I guess just picking up on, on several things that all of you have been saying, uh, it, it kind of talks about the importance of recognizing the imbalances of power that have both historically pervaded uh, the ways in which we relate to each other, but continue to pervade today. The sources of those imbalances change over time. So the power centers today might be very different to the power centers of the 19th century, but the kind of conceptual understanding that power is centered and needs to be kind of understood in that way. And that really the, the kinds of ideas that Dominic was talking about colonization is about compartmentalization. It's about separation and decolonization is about trying to break down those barriers to try and create more respectful spaces for conversations to take place in order to reflect the fact that the world is colorful, not monochromatic. You know, that there is a diversity of plurality of opinion uh, and those can have respectful conversations with each other. Um, Sarah, you've also been convening our working group in the department and Machipa, you've been doing a lot since you've been in the department just to kind of create spaces and platforms for us to speak. Maybe Sarah, I can ask you first to tell us a little bit about some of the initiatives that we've been taking. And I think that also responds to uh, one of the questions that I'm picking up on the, on, the, on, the, on the chat and I'm going to try and encourage that conversation now um, to tell us a little bit about the initiatives that we're taking to share those with, with uh, colleagues who've joined us uh, in the audience. Of course, yes. And um, I would certainly want uh, Matipa to have time to, to talk about what she's yeah. leading on. Um, but within the department since 2016, um, there was widespread interest in exploring what decolonizing meant for our institution, where we are right now, um, rather than picking up on anything that was um, going to be um, inappropriate. So we had a wide consultation and a group of academics, undergraduates and postgraduates, we created a, an agenda um, for um, change and sort of rationale for change as well across a number of different um, domains of department activity and that agenda now informs the work of the um, working group which holds team termly meetings um, and invites everyone to come along um, there's no committee there's no structured um, uh, sort of 
hierarchy within the um, working group. Um, and what we're carrying forward are um, um, efforts to inform the way that undergraduate and postgraduate teaching is done. That involves thinking not just about the reading lists, but also the kinds of assessment, the ways in which we think about the, the, the kind of grouping of topics um, in the um, curriculum, um, but also very much about training PhDs to do the research that they will go out and, and undertake in light of the decolonial debates. Um, and we're also thinking very carefully about the department's working environment and the way that it provides a space in which we share um, an office, I mean, office space and, and buildings. Um, there's very wide support for the um, decolonizing agenda from staff and students. Um, so I think I'll stop there, Pascal. Sure. And Matipa, you've been, you've been convening some really fantastic conversations uh, which I really enjoyed attending. Maybe you could share some, some of what you've been doing. Right, so um, Black and Geography was started by a group of us, um, the three of us, PhD students, um, the other two being Fred and Ed. And what really, there's the statistics that back this up and Pat, uh, Dr. Pat Noxolo spoke about this when she came to speak to us in our first Black and Geography talk about how about the whiteness of the discipline. And by whiteness, I'm not talking about, I, whiteness is not just about the color of one's skin, but also about the ideology. It's an ideology, right? And this ideology that is exclusionary for racialized, racialized students, um, particularly at the PhD level. And well, for me as, as a PhD student. So anyway, off, off of those experiences, we are trying to create to dismantle this whiteness and really foreground black experiences, black geographies and black voices in the discipline. And that is that was the thinking behind that. So, so far we've only had two sessions, but um, they've been really great. We had Pat, as I mentioned, and we just had Dr. Jasmine Scarlett, who's an independent researcher. And I think it was really important to have her because academic work is precarious, but it's even more so for racialized um, early career scholars. And it was really important to have her speaking to us about um, the links between physical and human geography. Dominic, you spoke to this at the beginning when you introduced your own experiences and issues around representation and visibility are so important. And uh, I'm embarrassed to say that, you know, uh, we continue to be very unreflective of the communities that we uh, that we respond to, uh, our, our intake remains uh, somewhat more mon monochromatic than than we would all like, and we are taking initiatives in this direction. We've introduced this year a scholarship for Black and mixed Black heritage undergraduate students, um, but I think Victoria's experience as a current undergraduate and yours thirty years ago sadly might not be that different in terms of the sort of the, the representation around the classroom. I mean, we haven't in this last year been able to sit in the large lecture theater to, to, to see a group of first year students. But actually, if I look out at those first year students today and the first year students who might have been in your cohort in the late 1980s, I, I don't think it's moved that much. Uh, and we need to do more. And I think we are trying, Dominic, I mean, just reflections on that, just in terms of the workplace as well. I mean, the workplaces that you inhabit, why does this matter? Well, it matters enormously. And thanks for the chance to <coughs> offer a thought there, Basco. Um, the plurality of um, opinion creates the best solutions. You get innovation at that edge and, and the monochromacity of thinking um, which I thought was a very, you know, it's a very important point, um, Matipa, that you made there, you know, in terms of what one means by whiteness. Uh, it, it doesn't help anybody. Uh, it, well, the fascinating thing, I think that in the workplace, particularly some of the larger uh, corporations, things are moving quite fast. Um, you know, there's certainly been very much movement in the US uh, on this over the past 12 months or so. Um, there's a far degree, higher degree of awareness of, um, balancing of gender, of uh, being um, respectful of they, as well as he and she, 
yeah, that has really kind of come through very strongly now. Um, I think that the um, power dynamic um, of uh, the uh, decolonization that is starting to emerge. If I give you a quick example, and there was a great question, by the way, in this thread. I'm, I'm going to pick up on that, that in a minute. So, so hold right. your thoughts on that one. Okay, I'll hold, that, hold my thought on that one. So on this <laughs> one um, it is important because um, the world, so the world that I exist in, um, you are bumping into multiple cultures, people from extremely different backgrounds all the time. And often um, some of the best entrepreneurs who've made it through life and become very uh, successful have fought against the odds rather than gone with the odds. And I can't tell you how many times the richest, most powerful uh, uh, CEOs or um, uh, people of influence that have come across, amazingly, their background was incredibly hard. Um, now, uh, is there a kind of, a, you know, a stretch there from, you know, a, let's say black to white? Well, certainly in some areas of the economy, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, arts, less so in science, increasingly so in, in finance and actually business. And it's very interesting looking at, if you like, the kind of generation of value creators under 30 compared to those who are over 60. Something is happening there. If, if academia... Um, isn't catching up with that, then it's kind of in a bad place. And in academia, geography, as I said at the beginning, is, I think maybe on Bass is one of the most important skill sets to be learning because it gives you the multiplurality of the discipline to go with the multiplurality of the kind of world that we live in. I mean, it was bizarre. I remember the economics department, everyone would, I mean, I've also got friends, you know, who did other things. Uh, you were learning economics and it was basically structural adjustment. Um, which was, you know, kind of, you know, form of colonialism, I suppose, and, you know, uh, free markets and that. So very, very um, libertarian and uh, um, uh, Milton Friedman and such. That was the economics department. Someone, I don't know if the course still exists, SPSS, the sort of social political. Okay, so how many books on Gramsci could you read in one day? You know, and it was bizarre. It was like this one institution with completely different swim lanes of learning going on and very little plurality. Um, and in the middle of it all, here we are as, as geographers looking at kind of, um, as you were saying, Sarah, glaciers or, you know, um, um, ethnographies or goodness knows what. It was, it was really cool. And I just think it's a very underplayed dimension in, in the discipline, um, which we absolutely need in this, in this day and age. So I'm sorry it doesn't seem to be better for you as you look out on the lecture theatre, but for all of us out there, you know, we're all, you know, um, keen to do what we can to change that. Um, and I know that we're supporting, you know, financially through everything that we can, the funds that you're putting together. So, um, you know, anything that we can do more of, the better. Is, you know. Victoria, you've been very active in, in, in trying to encourage uh, a much wider set of people to, to think about geography. I guess geography in itself as a discipline uh, has different resonances when people are thinking about uh, the avenues it opens up, the career opportunities, I think maybe it's not as obvious as disciplines that have a particular vocational pathway that is mapped out. So, you know, questions about what might we do with a geography degree? When I attend open days, I say, what can't you do with a geography degree? You know, you should be asking the question in the other way around, but there are sort of stereotypes around the discipline and the avenues it opens up. And I'm sure that's one of the barriers amongst many. Just your thoughts, because you've been done, doing so much with, with uh, you know, reaching out to try and get a much diverse, more diverse group of people to think about geography. I'd love to hear what your experience has been. Yeah, so I actually mentored two students who are currently in their first year doing geography. So I think mentoring definitely plays a big role. Um, so I was the second person in my school to go to Cambridge. The first person was another geographer um, and she played a very like massive integral role in me wanting to apply to Cambridge because it meant that someone who or someone similar background to myself who grew up in inner city London, went to state school as well, um, a non-selective state school, <laughs> um, <laughs> definitely helped with me thinking about being able to apply to study here. Um, there's a really good organisation that a few of my friends are on the committee called Black Geographers. And I definitely recommend people to look at it because they have um, great events. They also have got a report actually looking at the under underrepresentation of um, Black students who are currently studying geography at university. I think the issue is definitely a lot more multifaceted that people get that people give credit for. Mm -hmm. um, so like you mentioned, Basca, 
there's definitely a thing, especially for some students whose parents might be um, migrants um, or students who are maybe like first or second generation, there tends to be a lot of a greater focus on, you know, subjects like medicine, law, a bit more traditional. Um, and obviously that makes sense because if people's parents have come here, they've kind of had issues around like security, financial security. So I think definitely makes sense. So I think representation, having role models, people who have done what you want to do definitely makes a massive difference. And I think also having those wider conversations with teachers, I was actually really fortunate. So the teachers I had in school were amazing. Um, my job teacher is definitely probably the best teachers I had in school. I think, yeah, having that wider discussion around like universities, um, teachers, um, schools, parents, um, guardians in general. I think when we look at education, it's quite easy to kind of think that only one person, one or one institution has to play this big role. But I think when we talk about education more widely, it's about society as a whole, because um, fundamentally we're kind of trying to, yeah, raise the next generation of young people um, and yeah, adults. So I think it's yeah definitely um, a lot more wider than people give credit for. But yeah, definitely like I mentioned, check out Black Geographers on Twitter, on Instagram. Um, yeah, a great organization to look into. Thank you. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to pick up uh, a, a question that I think Dominic was wanting to get towards. And th there's been so many questions in the chat that I'm really sure that we won't have time to do justice to them in the hour that we have. What I will promise is that we will retain all those questions and we'll try and respond to them uh, uh, online separately. But the one I wanted to pick up wa was, I'm, I'm, go it's, I'm, I'm going to consolidate a number of questions which are around um, trying to understand the structures of coloniality today, rather than thinking about decolonization in the context of the histories of empire, which is sort of a way in which some people traditionally interpret it, and it absolutely isn't. So uh, a question that was asked very early in the conversation was, where are the structures of power today? Uh, I, I, an acronym that I hadn't actually heard, but it looks, uh, is it the FANGs, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google? Is that where the structures of power sit today? There's a related question where people are saying, how do we think about China's Belt and Roads Initiative? So it's actually sort of trying to ask these questions around uh, there is a history of coloniality, but there's a very present day coloniality in people's thinking, in the interactions of different uh, centers of power with each other, both internationally, as well as in national settings. And I think Sarah, your work with sort of national governments and indigenous communities, for example, brings that to mind. Another question is being asked in that context, you know, in countries like India, where is the kind of, where are the centers of power? Where, is, where does decolonization start to take place even within national boundaries? So Dominic, I know you wanted to come in maybe on the FANGS, which is an acronym I haven't heard, but maybe it's familiar out there. Uh, and then I want to broaden that into, you know, my, my, my other question around where does coloniality of thinking sit today? It's not just about the histories of empire. It's absolutely present here and now. So Dominic, you first, and then I'll, I'll go around the panel. Okay, thanks, Pascal. I'll be very brief, because we're, I know we're a bit, bit pressed. So there you are, take fangs away as a new acronym uh, for yourself. It's quite um, used quite a lot to describe that monopoly of power. Um, and um, if you're thinking about colonization, colony, you know, as an aggregation of power, the power dynamic, then many would argue um, that um, a lot of data, a lot of information um, is uh, concentrated in a few large uh, companies. Um, think about East India Company. Um, and, you know, so these are all, um, it's a very, it's a, it's a huge, interesting debate. And this is a really, really interesting one, because let's take this in two ways. One, um, how does one minimize the risk, but maximize the opportunity to society of the huge technological revolution that we're going through? Um, take kind of, you know, Google Earth or, or anything like that. It's a democratization. Um, think about that, um, when you had a 100th anniversary of the uh, syllabus, we were in the uh, Royal Geographical Society room upstairs, it had these amazing old power dynamic maps of like, let's draw the line down here and, you know, literally old school colonization stuff, you know, the you know, birthplace of this discipline. Um, and yet here we are today where the digital version of those maps can be completely democratized. Um, it's the reverse. Um, if you want to kind of 
be looking at or monitoring or seeing kind of where deforestation is taking place or pollution. You can have absolute um, transparency about what's going on. It's a completely different mindset around the idea of the map. The map was a source of power and information and control. Now it's a source of democratic engagement. Um, and yet the platform, the underneath it, um, is still perhaps there are a few uh, large organizations with control over large amounts of data. So the role of government um, becomes very, very interesting indeed in terms of making sure that there's equitable access and um, not too much asymmetrical information being stored. And of course, governments are it's very hard to be up to speed with kind of fast technological development. So all in all, it makes this discipline even more relevant today if you just take the idea of the map which are the core element of geography, but never before. Um, so uh, that's what I was going to kind of come back on. To. It's just, it's just brilliant that question about re reimagining when we say, you know, colonization in today's world, where there are these other kinds of, you know, dynamics of aggregation of information and 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 influence and and, and power, but at the same time, rapid democratization um, and transparency. It's a kind of Brilliantly confusing blend going on. Thanks. Uh, Dominic, where you've just left off, there's another question that I'm going to just bring in, uh, which is sort of us challenging you, maybe challenging what we've been saying to say, but surely the map is just a re representation of an objective reality. Why are we trying to talk about mapping as a sort of controversial or a contested process? Sarah, I'm going to ask you to respond to that one. Uh, I, I could read out the question, but you know, it's broadly asking the question that surely mapping is just an objective engineering process, not a social science. Uh. Okay, well, um, uh, un undergraduate supervision now in three minutes. <laughs> but less than three minutes. <laughs> less than three minutes, okay. Um, okay, so um, the um, a map relies on selection and particular forms of um, presenting information. And usually there are a lot of um, power dynamics behind the question of the selection. And there are often ways of thinking about the world that um, determine its um, presentation. And the presentational dimensions are really um, rooted in a particular um, Western um, a way uh, of organizing around lines of longitude and latitude, the creation of the Mercator map, which distorts um, the distribution of areas um, uh, in, a, in a particular way, which highlights the Northern hemisphere in terms of um, geographical area compared with, for example, the Peters projection. Um, and we are so used to a particular kind of map that we can't imagine others. But another very quick point is that um, maps can be used by indigenous people, for example, to document their territories or the particular forms of biodiversity in in their areas. But one of the um, things that happens is that those their forms of engagement with that territory, their relations with beings that we would think of as inanimate rocks, their relationship with those beings, um, cannot be represented in ways that Westerners currently understand. And so that makes the map um, a problematic um, interface between different plural ways of understanding the world. And of course, the people with the um, geological maps tend to have the power to um, come into a country and decide that they will um, be extracting minerals or um, oil from particular areas and indigenous people's maps are situated in very unequal power relations. So in my part of the world, that's where the coloniality of power exists currently. Um, and I'll confess just as a sort of footnote to that, to torturing generations of applicants to Fitzwilliam by uh, using in my interviews, um, three representations of LA in, from a book called Mental Maps. And these are three representations of a long-term LA resident, a recent immigrant to the city, and a person of color. And they actually 
three completely different representations of the city of Los Angeles. Uh, and I just show them to potential candidates and I say, tell me why, tell me what you see. They suddenly realize it's the same place, but drawn in very different ways. And they realize that our mental maps of the same place are so reflective of our socioeconomic positionality in relation to place. So uh, it kind of, it, it's, it's, it's a tough question for a 17 year old sitting in a nervous interview room, but that's, that's one that I use quite, quite regularly. Um, Matipa and Victoria, I'm gonna close with sort of, I'm very conscious of time, but um, someone in the chat has asked a question about uh, what are the challenges that you personally have experienced and what could the department and the university do better to support you? And I know there's a lot, but I'm giving you 30 seconds each. Uh, Victoria, you first. Yeah, I think very briefly, I think the um, university is, is definitely doing a lot more um, than like previously. So I think, yeah, just trying to like strengthen different networks with students and kind of allowing students to know that support is available. So I think for quite a lot of students, irrespective of their um, background, it can be quite difficult to ask for help, especially if you've been quite self-sufficient during your time at school. So just kind of knowing that support is available um, and trying to, yeah, make that clear. <laughs> Thank you, um, Mativa. I think um, Victoria slightly touched on this, but I think institutional culture is very important um, and just creating spaces just where, for me as a black student, I can feel like I can just exist, not as a spokesperson for all Zimbabweans or all Africans or all black women, but just be Mativa, um, that would be really great. Um, and also in just wanting to exist, I would also just love to see myself in the professors who are hanging on the walls or I don't know, it would just be good to see someone who looks like me and who has my life experiences, um, you know, just to be a normal site, yeah. Uh, Dominic, I'm going to come to you for your closing thoughts. As a friend and well-wisher of the department, what more should we be doing? Uh, you've got a great set of alumni, it looks like, who are listening <laughs> to this. I was just looking at all the questions. Um, and Matthew, hello. I didn't realise that you have the uh, uh, department photo and you're picking us out. <laughs> um, uh, I would like all of those who benefited from this wonderful subject over the years and who are cognizant of the uh, plurality of challenges that we face now to... And if we're lucky enough to have, you know, made somewhat of a success of our lives to um, circle back and help you, uh, Bashka and team, as you are um, um, trying to take the lead here with Cambridge Geography Department and with those funds to get more people in, not only um, from, you know, across uh, different uh, uh, racial backgrounds, but also different um, economic backgrounds. Um, I think it's really important um, and that's something I'm, as you know, personally committed to helping and I would ask anybody who's watching this um, to also recognise the leadership that you're showing and help in that regard. I think that's the way you can start. I love the mentoring thing, uh, uh, Victoria. I think that's brilliant. Um, so that would be something internally, I guess, that you know you could really do and maybe, maybe even show the way forward through geography being at such a plurality subject and pick out a couple of other different departments. Uh, and Sarah, I'm going to close with you. Obviously, you've been doing so much uh, and giving us so much leadership in this area within the department, but uh, a very early question in the chat was about, can you give us tips about ways we can decol decolonize geography in our everyday lives? You know, what, what can we take this beyond the sort of narrow confines of the academic discipline and the department that we're talking about? You know, what resonance does this have beyond the academy uh, any any sort of quick thoughts about that you know is it is it about reflecting new mindsets new ways of thinking new approaches what would be your sort of takeaways from 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 that um well i'm a great believer in sort of decolonizing from where you stand mm -hmm. so i think that um recognizing one's own positionality and the ways in which um, that grants particular access or, or limits one's access to different opportunities. But I suppose that, you know, there's a number of different ways in which, um, you know, if, if you go into the 
um, to a national trust house now. There's going to be more information about, um, you know, the relationship between colonialism and um, the, 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 the kind of things that you see around you, um, thinking about different kinds of maps, thinking about getting to know parts of the city you live in, which perhaps you don't know, sort of changing the route to work. Um, you know, I, I find it difficult to think of um, a particular highlight or, or sort of pr um, proposal, just because I think that um, we are in such um, different um, situations. Um, but sometimes, you know, I do find myself listening to the radio and I am listening to somebody um, reporting um, from uh, a part of the world that I'm completely unfamiliar with. And, and I suppose I try and really pause and think about what it is to, to be that person and, and why they are saying those, the, the things that they do say and, and the kinds of ways in which I can both take what I already know, but also try and recognize that their voice is coming from, from a quite a different place. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I really have to apologize to so many people who've asked us a brilliant set of questions in the chat. I think it reflects how lively this conversation is. And uh, I, I hope we'll find opportunities to carry on this conversation. I think the work that we're doing is important. It's uh, still very much in its inception. Uh, I'm very grateful to my colleagues who've been able to join me on the panel, Dominic, Victoria, Matipa, Sarah, thank you for taking time to share your perspectives. Uh, I look forward to taking these agendas and these conversations forward. And I encourage people who've been on the chat uh, to get in touch with me, to get in touch with Sarah, who's been leading the group, but also with all of us to try and explore ways in which we can both develop our mutual understanding of these issues and also then take that forward in terms of agendas that might support each other's work. There have been some fantastic questions from people who are trying to engage with this in schools. And I think there's a conversation to be had here. I know that uh, wider institutions like the Royal Geographic Society are very sensitive to these questions as well. So there's, there's an opening to take these conversations forward I think we've only scratched the surface this afternoon, but I think being respectful of everyone's time, I promise this would be an hour long conversation. We really must stop at this point, but I'm very grateful for everyone who's been here and particularly to the panel for sharing your thoughts. Thank you very much. And a recording of this will be available online. So those who haven't been able to attend, please, please do uh, pass on the word that shortly it'll be available online to see from our website. Thanks and I'll close with that. Thank you very much. <laughs>